Hello, my friends, and welcome to another Robcast. Now, usually I record these episodes in the back house, but I just went back there to record, and my son, who's in a number of bands, was back there rehearsing with one of his bands, which, as a dad, is anything better than that space being filled with hot, sweaty musicians? So uh, I have the biggest dad smile on my face right now, by the way. So I got the microphone and I brought it in um, and put it at the table, but my son is eating there, my daughter's back and forth, that's not gonna work. So I've literally been walking around the house with a laptop and a notebook. And uh, the notebook is where uh, I have this episode outlined. Pen and paper, can you hear that my friends? We're analog there. Pen and paper, although we also have a laptop, so it's not that analog. But um, I thought, well, my other son has a desk in his room. I should go in there. So I go in there. By the way, it's a hot, sunny, beautiful day. The shades are drawn. It's dark. And guess who's in there? The dog. Who knew that on a beautiful day, our dog's favorite place to hang out is under my son's desk in his dark room? <laughs> so that's where I am. I'm at his desk, and there's a dog asleep at my feet, and I want to talk to you in this episode about transactionalism, which, if you're like me and you heard, you heard somebody use the word transactionalism, you'll be like, I'm already bored. But hang with me, because uh, one of my hopes is that you not only learn what this means, but that you realize that you've seen this before and you know how to spot it, because uh, we need to move in a different direction. And... Oh man, I'm, there's, so I want to show you a couple parables and show you how this all relates. Then I want to talk about subterranean senses at the end, which is a phrase I made up. And uh, yeah, so all kinds of places we're going to go. First off, I should say, what is the Bible Belt Tour? Launches in a couple of weeks. So if you live in the South, I am coming your way. I've actually always wanted to do a Bible Belt Tour. Um, and so I'm coming to... North Carolina, Virginia, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, um, and I think Birmingham, Alabama. I was told it's sold out, but I think they're going to add some staying room only seats in case you went and saw that it's sold out. But um, yeah, tickets are going for that, and um, oh, I am <laughs> I absolutely love like a good club tour like this, but the Deep South in the middle of July, are you kidding me? And of course I'm gonna end in Memphis so my daughter and I can go to Graceland because that's how you do that. So um, that's what we got going there. And um, this episode, I've been doing this series on alternative wisdom on and off. This episode is called Sheep, Coins, and Sons. And this is part six of alternative wisdom, which could also be called the wisdom, um, could be called post-conventional wisdom at some level, you could call it gospel wisdom. Uh, so you have your wisdom, which is this is how the world works, A plus B equals C. And that conventional wisdom, you have pre-conventional, conventional, post-conventional post wisdom. That wisdom is very helpful and necessary, but there are times when you're actually tapping into a different kind of wisdom, and I call that alternative or gospel wisdom. So what I want to do in this episode is I want to walk you through three Jesus parables. And um, some of you, they may be really familiar, but I want to show you how they relate what's going on just below the surface. And uh, I mean, this, this has so deeply affected how I see the world, obviously, um, that I, oh man. So uh, here we go. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, and if you're new to the Bible, you're new to Jesus' -y teachings, just hang with me. We're talking about what it means to be human. So what does it mean to be human? And is there wisdom about what it means to be alive, what it means to be living the most vital life possible. Is there wisdom to be had for all of us? That's sort of the baseline of my work. Jesus told these three parables and they're arranged, whoever wrote the Gospel of Luke, apparently Luke, arranged them in a particular way and connected them together. So Jesus uh, was known for hanging around and eating with, and eating in the first century was a political act because there was a religious establishment that decided who was considered clean, who was considered unclean, who was in, who was out, who was the righteous who belonged, and who were the unrighteous, they called them sinners, who were part of the problem. Because remember, these people had been conquered by one military superpower after another. 
So deep in this Jewish story, deep in these people's bones was this belief that their God was the God and their God, they believed, created the earth and was the ruler of everything. So why did they keep getting conquered? And why did they keep getting conquered by people who couldn't care less about their God, who didn't even acknowledge their God? You see what I'm saying? Do you see how so much of what people believe is shaped by economics and politics and culture? So these people had a driving question. How come we keep getting conquered and oppressed by these military superpowers who make our life miserable? And so there were a, was a religious establishment that gained a tremendous amount of power who said the reason is we have people in our midst who essentially break God's commandments. They're the problem. Are you with me here? Parentheses, 2017, they're the problem. So they had very complicated rationale and whole systems for discussing who's part of the problem, who's not part of the problem. Some of the language they used is who's clean, who's unclean. And so in the first century, who you ate with was a political statement because eating with somebody, which was called table fellowship, was essentially saying this person's okay. And so there were a number of people who said you cannot dine with somebody who's part of the problem because you're saying they're okay when in fact they're why we're suffering like this. So that's why, by the way, if you read through the Gospels, why Jesus how often he's dining with people, and you think, was this guy hungry? Did he work up an appetite? Why is he having so many meals? Those, that's all, in some senses, it's like, I wouldn't say political theater, but he's making statements. And this was, a, this was as electric or volatile an issue as you can even imagine is, who is it okay to eat with? So when Jesus, uh, like Luke begins chapter 15, there are people are gathering around Jesus, tax collectors and sinners was the phrase they used. Um, table fellowship, eating with people was a bold, countercultural, subversive political statement. And who Jesus dines with is the outcasts, the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, everybody that the establishment said they're the problem. How's that for setup? You with me now? So uh, what we find out is that a group of the religious leaders said this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And once again, it wasn't just a meal. It was a cultural, economic, political statement uh, that had just layer upon layer upon layer. So in response to this, Jesus tells them parables. And remember when we talked about post-conventional wisdom, conventional wisdom loves straightforward either-or questions. Conventional wisdom loves litmus questions, which is, do you believe this, yes or no? Uh, conventional wisdom often thrives on the literal, straightforward soundbite question. Are you this or are you this? It loves labels. It loves categories. It loves questions where it's taken complex, mysterious issues people have been discussing for thousands of years and turns them into yes or no or either or. Are you with me on this? Conventional wisdom loves to take the depth and complexity of life and boil it down to are you this or are you this? Do you believe this or do you believe that? And then the questions are essentially litmus test questions because if you say no or if you say yes or if you don't give the proper answer, then you can be labeled, excluded. You can warn people about this person. You can call them whatever language your tribe uses for somebody who is, going back 2,000 years, part of the problem. I know. We're still in the intro, by the way, and how this, so much here. So, in response to this grumbling by these religious leaders against who Jesus is spending his time with, he says, suppose if one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Okay, wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Tell me if this isn't awesome. Um, in the first century, one of the things that had happened among religious leaders is there was essentially almost like a caste system or a grading system on different professions. And some professions were considered unclean because of the nature of the profession. So whether it was working with animals, working with substances that were continued, that would essentially make somebody ritually defiled or unclean. And so people who worked with sheep were considered unclean. And uh, the Hebrew phrase is am ha'aret, essentially means people of the land. And so if you were a Pharisee or a religious leader, 
you would never do that kind of work because that work was considered beneath you and it would considered to be something that would make you unclean. Um, so when Jesus is talking to the religious leaders and he says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. <laughs> this is a classic example where people read right through it and completely miss what an unbelievable opener that is. Imagine the most conserv I don't even know if conserve is the right word, self-righteous. Uh, imagine the most religious person that you know and saying to them, telling them a story and saying, you know how it is when you run a strip club, <laughs> when one of your employees breaks her ankle. Do you know what I'm saying? Like even the suppose one of you has a hundred sheep is he is so punking them. Oh my word. Okay. So Jesus says, I mean, if, if you own a hundred sheep and you lose one of them, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. So first off, there's a celebration when the shepherd finds the sheep. But then secondly, the way that sheep herding worked in the first century, he would put it on his shoulders, but then the sheep had to be carried because a lost sheep generally freezes up, it doesn't move. It would then have to be carried all the way back to the village, which was uh, arduous to say the least. So there is a moment of celebration followed by what some call the work of restoration, the work of actually bringing the sheep home. I know that preaches. Then when he gets home, he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. So there's actually two moments of celebration. The moment when the sheep is located, then the moment when the larger community celebrates together that the sheep has been brought home. So then Jesus says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous person who do not need to repent. Now, I know for some of you, like words like sinner and repent sort of pew, pew. Uh, I don't know what that noise is other than it sets off alarms. So remember, sinner was a political term. Sinner was a loaded religious term that had all sorts of implications for why we keep conquered. So remember that term was an electric term. It was a term of categorization and, clad and sort of classification in the first century. And then remember the word repent. The word repent comes, it draws on this ancient Hebrew tradition of the word teshuva. And there's actually a whole Robcast episode about this word teshuva. It means to return. So, um, a sinner who returns, I know it's like you wandered from the path and then you return home. We'll get to this in a minute because the new Testament was written in Greek and there's a different word in Greek. Um, and when you see that pow, hold on. Then he does a second parable. It's similar to the first. And then it goes like this. Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who comes home, who repents, who returns. Okay, so we have a lost sheep and then we have a lost coin. Third story, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Now, first off, in a patriarchal society like the first century, when a son says to his father, give me my share of the inheritance, this is so shocking. This is so offensive. You would never do this because the inheritance would be handed out when the dad was dead. Inheritances were divided when the father passed on. So to say to the father, please give me my share of the inheritance was essentially saying, dad, I wish you were dead. And in that society where respect for your elders was sort of key, was central to everything. That's how society kept together was respect for the patriarch. So when Jesus begins a story like this, I can't even imagine how an audience would have responded. You, we don't even really have categories for how offensive, what people would be like, what the, what? What kind of story is this? Um, and the father does it, which is completely bizarre. It's like a one-two punch in the first two lines of the story. The father does it. And remember, the inheritance was divided and the older son got a larger portion than the younger son. But if the inheritance, inheritance was passed along early, it would be less because the idea is the father is building up the inheritance. 
So when the younger son asks for inheritance, he's speeding up the dispersal of the inheritance, which means the dispersal is going to be less. And that means that the older brother is going to get less. So the father doing this, granting his request and giving him the money, is taking essentially money and earning potential and wealth away from the older brother. So if you're the older brother, you are pissed that the father has granted this completely absurd, bizarre request. Now, the son wanders away, he squanders it all, he spends it all, and then he realizes, man, even my father's servants have it better off than me. And he comes home, the father's waiting for him in the driveway, I added that part, welcomes him home, throws a huge party, says my son was dead, now he's alive, he's lost, now he's found. The older brother doesn't want to join the party. Um, the father goes to the older brother and says, my son's come home, party with us. And he essentially says, you never even gave me a party for me and my friends. Now, a couple things going on here. Uh, and I wrote a bit about this in my book, Love Wins, because both sons are essentially separated from the father. The one is separated because of his bad deeds. The other son is separated from the father because of his good deeds. You with me on this? The one son goes away, squanders the money, makes all sorts of destructive choices. He's clearly separated from the father. The other son stays home and he's like, I labored all these years for you. I did all this. The older son thinks that his good son behavior was earning him something. So the younger son thinks that his bad deeds separated him the older son thinks that his good deeds connected him to the father. See, both of them think that the father is playing by the scorecard and keeping track, and you have points deducted, and you gain some points. Nice. Both of them, thinks the father, both of them think the father's love is determined by their actions, whether good or bad. But what, the fa what Jesus does with the father in this story is the father welcomes the one son back, and essentially puts a robe and a ring on him, which is saying, you've always been my son, you're my son, welcome home, to the older son who says, you never even gave me something to celebrate with my friends. Uh, the father says to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. By the way, that's my favorite verse in the Bible, for the record. The older son essentially says, you're always with me. I mean, the, older, the father says to the older son, wait, did you think that all your good deeds were earning you something? Did you think that all the years you stayed home and worked hard, did you think that I somehow then would love you more? Did you think that my love was based on point keeping or a scoreboard or something? You've misunderstood me just as much as my other son misunderstood me. Oh, come on, we could keep going there, but I got to keep moving. I know there's so much there. Did you think that all your good stuff was earning you something? What are you talking about? Oh, come on. Raise your glasses. So good. Now, sheep, coin, sun. Now, let's fly a little bit higher and let's ask questions about what unites these three parables and why does Luke arrange these three parables as a flow? It's almost like a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, really long verse, chorus to it. You know what I mean? Because each one ends with rejoicing over something that was lost being found, something that was lost being recovered and restored, something that was lost coming home to where it belonged the whole time. So undergirding the three parables is all three things belong. Their fundamental state is belonging. The sheep to the shepherd, the coin to the woman, the son to the dad. They belong, they're lost, and the story is about the energy of the shepherd, woman, and father, and their rescuing, welcoming, receiving, restoring that which is lost. The energy is not flowing from the thing that is lost. The energy that moves the story, the catalyst, the engine of the story is the movement of the one to whom each belongs, rescuing, restoring, 
and returning things to their proper place. Are you with me on this? Do you see conventional wisdom loves either or literal questions, but when you move to post-conventional alternative wisdom, when you move to gospel wisdom, you generally find yourself moving into stories, parables, images, pictures, sounds, textures. I wonder how many of you, as you've grown, as you've matured, as you've expanded, as your consciousness has been heightened, as you've experienced moments of transcendence and enlightenment, uh, maybe not always in sync with your tribe. Maybe you have seen things that those around you don't see. Maybe uh, you have people you're close to who are still thinking exactly like you thought a decade ago, and yet you've at some level, you've transcended, you moved on, you don't see it that way anymore. And what's so interesting often is when the tribe tries to figure out why you're living your life now like this, or why you think these things or believe these things or, or are ordering your life this way. Often it's, well, do you still believe X? Well, are you still Y? Are you still committed to Z? Like it pushes you. And how many times for some of you, are you, the only way to describe what's happening is like an image. You know what? I feel like a boat that's been anchored for so many years and now the anchor has been pulled up and I can sail. Do you know what I mean? Yes. To every single one of you who have ever found yourself responding, depressing, litmus, either or questions with images and metaphors, which often doesn't help. Are you with me on this? People look at you like, what? You feel like a, what? A 13th vibration of the color of turquoise? What are you talking about? <laughs> but this is one of the reasons why I show you this is when Jesus talks about alternative wisdom, when he talks about gospel wisdom, he shifts into a different mode and he tells stories. And he tells parables that have all sorts of unexpected edges. They're kind of, they're shocking at one level. They're completely shocking. Well, uh, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep. <laughs> You're talking to the religious establishment saying, suppose one of you did the thing that none of you would ever do because it would make you unclean, which is a thing you would never ever allow yourself to become. Oh, or the younger son that asks for the share and he does it. And the shock of the older brother who's like, what, you're seriously going to welcome him home? Yeah, of course I am. Yeah. And by the way, you, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. You've had this party the whole time. Essentially, the father says to the older brother, you've been at the party the whole time and you didn't realize it. We could have partied at any moment, but you were so stuck in your goodness, in your rule keeping, in your religious righteousness that you never realized that you were at the party the whole time. We could have celebrated any moment. You never even asked. Oh, oh, oh. Now, what does the sheep do? Look in the first parable. What does the sheep do? Nothing. Nothing. The story turns on the sheep's lostness. What does the coin do? What does the coin do? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> it's found. That's what it does. It's found by its owner to which it belonged the whole time. And the son, what's the son do? The son does return home, but he returns home under the assumption that he would never be welcomed in. So he's like, I, I might as well just go back and try to be a slave. So he's never in his mind is he picturing any sort of restoration. He's picturing, I might as well just try and get a job like a, like a servant. And the father goes way beyond, throws the party, doesn't let him slink in the back door and sleep in the barn, but puts a robe and a ring on him. So the stories turn on the nothingness, the lack of action of the coin, son, and what's the first one? Sheep. The engine of the story, and you know Jesus knows exactly what he's doing here. The engine of the story is the one to whom it belongs, not the thing that is lost. The thing that is lost just stays lost. The sheep just stays lost until found. Now, why do I keep bringing this up? Because of something called transactionalism. Transactionalism is the belief, is the understanding, if you do A, then God will do B. Transactionalism is, if you would just do this, 
then the universe, love, the divine, God, whatever, will then do something because you did something. Transactionalism for many people is how they understand spirituality, how they understand religion, how they understand how the thing works, is you just have to, what do you, just tell me what I need to do and then I'll do it and then hopefully that will get me the points, that will get me the favor, that will earn me the thing that I'm desperately seeking here. And the reason why I bring this up is having just spent a number of weeks um, bookstore tour and taking questions and having spent the past couple of years taking questions all over the place, you would be so intrigued to see over months and months of events how many questions have an anxiety lurking just below the surface. It's an anxiety, it's a tension, it's a, it's a worry, um, it's like an open nerve. And, and it's almost like when I hear the question, I hear what the person is asking intellectually, but there is a spirit or an energy undergirding the question that like leaps out, it hits me every time, which is essentially what I need to do. Seriously, just tell me what I need to do. Just tell me what, and, and underneath that is a message that so many people were given, which is the answer is you need to try harder. If you would just try harder, then things would go better for you. Now. There are situations, if you're lazy, if you're not taking responsibility, if you're not making amends, if you're not, there are situations, obviously, 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 where you, you do need to work harder. You need to discipline yourself and you try harder. But, but in matters of spirit, in matters of ultimate worth, value, and acceptance, because that's what we're talking about here. We're, we're, we're in the realm of spirit. For many people, the fundamental way they understand God, Jesus, universe, faith, spirituality was the answer is generally going to be you need to try harder. Just tell me what I need to do. There's no larger flow. There's no force that's at work that you're joining. It's just what do I need to do? Or uh, just last week, somebody on a, on a Facebook Live Q&A said, just tell me how do I get saved? Just tell me what I need to do. Um, now, transactionalism is lethal because what it does is it loads your heart down with a creeping, ambiguous anxiety that you're the issue. And if you would just do X, then favor would kick in, blessing, abundance, whatever it is that people have been told would just kick in, becomes the driving question. But in these stories, the coin, the sun, the sheep, they already belong. They don't do anything. They let themselves be found, <laughs> which even is an awkward sentence. But at the core of each of these stories is trust that the thing that you are desperately searching for you already belong. It is already yours. The thing that you are pursuing, you already possess. The son cannot not belong to the father. The sheep cannot not belong to the shepherd. The coin cannot not belong to the woman. Belonging is the natural state. And so transactionalism is a fundamentally different posture to life than trust, which is an announcement of what's already true about you. You're already at the party. You are always with me and everything I have is yours. Of all the language Jesus could put in the mouth of the God character, this is the line of dialogue he puts in the, the God character's mouth, the Father's mouth. You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. Now, this takes, takes us into a distinction between form and spirit. And we'll probably have to do a whole episode on this at some point. But there is a difference between form and spirit. And here's the thing. Two people can be doing the same thing in form, but from a 
totally different spirits. So there's form and there's spirit. Form is the thing you're doing. Spirit is the animating energy behind the thing that you're doing. So two people may be doing the same thing, maybe the same form. The one may be doing it out of a deep sense of fear, terror, um, anxiety, worry, stress. They're trying to earn something, worth, value, love. They're trying to answer that voice that tells them they are unworthy. And so two people may be doing the same thing, and the one is doing it from a deep, deep spirit place of anxiety, fear, and worry. The other may be doing it from a place of great joy and response. I'm loved. I'm at the party. Now in light of that, what am I going to give my energies to? And you'll notice that people who actually stand with the poor, who stand for injustice, who actually do good work in the world over a sustained long period of time are often people who have come to see, I'm already at the party. And it's this kind of gratitude and peace and calm that out of that, well, now what am I going to do? What an amazing gift I have received. Everything I could ever strive to earn, I already possess. So in light of this beautiful gift, what are we going to do with it? Well, let's go feed some people. Let's get people some water. Let's teach. Let's organize. Let's start some new businesses. Let's raise some kids. Let's plant a garden. Let's do this. Do you see what I mean by the difference between form and spirit? Two people may be doing the same thing, driven by very different spirits. The one may be deep in transactionalism. And by the way, in the religious world, there's generally always a new book by somebody who is smack dab in the middle of transactionalism, telling you, if you would just do this, then God would love you, you would have God's favor, you would be in, if you would just be more this, more that. And the reason why those books sell kajillions of copies is because for lots of people, when they say spirituality, they say spirit. When they say gospel, what they mean is transaction. Just tell me what I got to do. Tell me what I got to do. Tell me what I got to do. And the gospel is the announcement that everything you could ever try and do has already been done. In the words of Jesus, it is finished. Do you see why this, do you see why religion in its efforts to announce gospel can sometimes just be another form of transactionalism. Yeah. Now one more, couple more things. The Greek word for repent, because uh, you have the Hebrew word for repent, teshuva, and we've gone into the history of that and explored that, the idea of return, um, the idea of turn from the word shuv. But the Greek word for repent, when Jesus used, when the Greek here says repent, is that repent is the word metanoia. Meta means like change, like metamorphosis. Meta means change. Noia means thinking, right? You're, you're with me on this, right? Change your thinking, see it in a different way. So when Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, repent for the kingdom of God is near. When the apostles are asked, what do I need to do to get saved? And he says, well, repent. Uh, you have to see it in a different way. What do I have to do? Uh, see who you are and how it's always been in a new way. <laughs> it's awesome, isn't it? I am telling you, few things will free you. Few things will open you up. Few things will rescue you from the cripple ang crippling anxiety of, I don't measure up. I've wasted my life. Uh, I'm unworthy. I'm worthless. Few things will rescue you with more power and force than a proper alternative wisdom gospel announcement of the divine who says, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. All your striving, all your trying to earn, all of what you thought was gaining you points. No, nope, doesn't work that way. Doesn't work the way. The thing you've been trying to get, you've had the whole time. And, and the reason why this is so crucial is you and I were good children of the modern age, right? We're fish swimming in the sea of enlightenment, like w certainty, facts, evidence, logic, reason. We have convinced ourselves that even people, I even pe hear people say with a straight face, like I'm a, I'm a facts person. I just don't do that nonsense. I need the data. I'm a rational person. I really think things through. And yet, how do you really live? 
Because the same person who tells you how rational and logical and facts-based they are, they'll talk about, well, I'm not, I'm not feeling that up. I'm feeling down. Yeah, there's some good vibes. I'm feeling it. I'm not feeling it. I don't know. It's just not there. I don't have the mojo, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? It's like we convince ourselves of how rational and calm and cool and data-based and how we've seen the research. And yet, how do you actually live? You actually live from a deep place. It's like these, there are these subterranean senses that are like subcortical. They're like pre or post or super irrational. They, that that's actually the place that you live from. Heart, spirit, soul. That's actually the place you live from. Because if you were to say to me, well, I don't know, it's just a, it's just a bad day. I could give you all sorts of facts about why it's actually a good day. And you could tell me it's a good day and I could give you all sorts of facts about how it's actually a bad day with all the horrible things happening in the world. So we actually don't, no matter how much we say it, live from a factual assessment and analyzation of what's happening right now in our life. We live from a deeper place. And you see why these parables have endured for thousands of years. You see why alternative wisdom takes you into a whole other place. You see why gospel announcement just subverts all the security guards you have around your mind as it just goes right to this place deep within you and it announces, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. And in your lostness, in your wandered offness, in your brokenness, in your cluelessness, in all of the disappointments, hurts, wounds, all of the sense in which you just don't measure up, all the sense in which you've been trying to make something happen and yet you feel powerless, like how much longer do I keep? It's at that moment that we're met with this announcement. You've been a daughter the whole time. You've been a son the whole time. You've belonged the whole time. And the message for so many of us that was steeped into us was the answer. It was always, well, the answer is obviously you need to try harder. And what alternative wisdom, what gospel wisdom does is it goes right to that voice in your head that is like a default setting, right? Are you with me on this? How many times things go wrong and immediately you're disappointed, you're jealous, you're angry, you're frustrated, you're whatever. You don't feel like your career is going where it's supposed to. You feel as a parent like, oh, I'm just not that good of a parent. And your default setting is obviously the answer is I need to try harder. And maybe there are things you need to do. Separate issue, spirit, soul, heart, receives the gospel announcement. You are always with me and everything I have is yours. And then when you move from that place, you're coming from a totally different place. So I think about all the people I've interacted with who there's this base level of anxiety beneath the question. Uh, and I think about the invitation to be free from all that anxiety. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're here. We're breathing. We're the recipients of this extraordinary gift. There is a miracle. Did I say it right? Miracle? <laughs> okay, I still can't say it right. There is a supernatural phenomenon we know to be your life. Let's start there. Let's start with the gratitude that you're here and you're breathing. And then let's move to the insistence in these stories Jesus tells is that the deepest forces of the universe are on your side. That the universe is not neutral to you, but that that which is lost, that which is dead, that which has wandered, an extraordinary amount of energy is being expended to rescue, to restore, and to renew. You see the energy flow in that then. So when I find myself tired, when I find myself disappointed, frustrated, hurt, wounded, uh, if I slow down and I think about it just in terms of the exchange of energy, hold on, hold on, hold on. I feel lost now. I feel like I wandered off. I feel like I'm far from home. I'm feeling like this one issue is just winning. <laughs> I'm defeated. If I slow down, alternative wisdom, gospel wisdom, is, brings with it the announcement that I'm already at the party. 
and all of the lists I have of things I need, all of the things that would just, that would make things complete, that would make things better, that would fix this problem. Hold on, hold on. I'm already at the party. I'm already at the party. There's already rejoicing. The band has already started. The DJ has already warmed up. We're already going. Yeah. Yeah, try this. Try this in your commute. Try this when you're frustrated with your kid. Try this when you feel like you just gave everything to your work and it wasn't received or understood or no one cared. Pause. Pause and say, is the answer here that I need to try harder? Or is there some alternative wisdom? And then try that mantra, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Oh man, this, my brothers and sisters, this can change the game. Yeah, I love talking about this stuff. I love it. I love it. So when you find yourself up against transactionalism, remember, trust. Trust. That's the only thing left to do. Trust. Trust that this is actually true. It's an, annou an announcement. It is not an announcement of what you need to do to change everything. It's an announcement that you are invited to trust that everything you were trying to change has already happened. And then you rest in that sheep coins and sons my friends grace and peace